Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session, the first session looking at Patient Grisel by John Philip. The comedy of Patient and Meek Grisel, wherein is declared the good example of her patience towards her husband and likewise the due obedience of children toward their parents. So there, uh, newly compiled by John Philip. Uh, dates from the early 1560s, 1561 is a sort of general date uh, bandied about variously. Um, it uh, is uh, based on on uh, sources that we may or may not discuss as we go. We're going to get through the first third-ish or so of the play. Uh, there, we, we sort of have to ditch midway through uh, the sixth scene uh, uh, we will uh, see how that goes precisely where we actually stop this session um, the uh, the text has been prepared uh, by uh, Helen Good who's uh, who is with us but is invisible on this video uh, and uh, as ever this is a, a ongoing editorial session so there are uh, some bits in bold in the text as sent out of uh, which are unresolved questions uh, by all means uh, put such uh, thoughts into the chat about uh, dealing with such things otherwise just say what you see say what you see that's always the rule and if the script is wrong the script is wrong um uh, we have reading uh, far too many parts but we're all going to bunch together and, uh, and and hustle as best as we can uh, reading uh, the marquis and first servant today is i am steve longstaff scholar of early modern drama based in the northwest of england uh, reading the preface, Sobriety and Genical is... That's me, Rachel, actor in New Jersey. Uh, reading Reason, Mother and Second Servant is... Hi, I'm Eric and I will try to be reasonable, although I think this is quite like one of those plays that, you know, Raw Dull would hate considering it's about obedience of children towards their parents. Uh, reading a politic persuasion and the ladies, all the ladies plural, is... Liza Graham, actor, singer, and Renaissance text coach, two actors in London. And reading Fidence and Grizel is... Bryony Sparrow, the drama queen from East Midlands. And uh, I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I'll be reading uh, the stage directions as and when they appear. Um, so the... Uh, Printed text comes with a handy doubling guide, uh, doubling the play down to eight. Uh, unfortunately, it's not less handy when you realise that the doubling scheme doesn't actually work and that uh, there are various clashes where people are on stage with themselves. So uh, we're going to ignore that, and especially as we actually have too few people to technically read the play. Uh, and we're going to leap to the preface, uh, whether this is an actual practical prologue or whether this is a more literary device, we will find out in a moment. So I'll ask ask uh, Rachel to, uh, to read the preface, please. If case by poet's skill or palace's prudent aid, historians often histories, their whole delights have stayed to pen and paint forth painfully the modest lives of those that do in virtue's school their hope and confidence repose, then wandering in the forests wide where fragrant where fragrant flowers grow. I mean in searching histories wherein doth wisdom flow. Our author found out one wherein he took delight and moved thereto by his friend, gave frank consent to write. So simply as he could, though wanting haughty skill, in that from Helicon's fair spring, the muses him exile. Nay would K Cytheria seem, Dame Cleo to permit, to garnish him with rhetoric, the gods did frown at it. So peevish Pan possessed him, whose rustic pipes did carp, whose concords were far dissonant to sweet Apollo's harp. Yet bear with him, and us also, we humbly you desire. Let Grissel's patience sway in you, we do you all require, whose history we unto you in humble wise present, beseeching God, we always may in trouble be content and learn with her in weal and woe uh, the Lord our God to praise. My time is past, my charge is done, I needs must go my ways. And the preface goes their merry way. Um, it feels uh, reasonably performative to me, though not necessarily fully informative. Uh, any uh, brief thoughts on this before we actually get into the, uh, the, the play text itself? 
it is absolutely fine for no one to have any opinions on this. Uh, th th that is absolutely fine. Uh, we have had that before with prologues and prefaces. Some leap out at us and some do not. Oh, Rachel. Rachel wants to dive in. Uh, I just think as a character, if you were going to characterize this preface and make them, you know, into somebody as a part of the play, maybe they're a, a nymph or a fairy that they know all these, uh, you know, they know about the muses or something like that. Who knows? Mm. Uh, Eric, then Liza. I was going to say it's interesting how uh, basically it's kind of... The, the way this is written it suggests that, yeah, this is a person who's really bored and decided. <laughs> so it, it kind of went, well, you know, history doesn't count. Um, I can't write a, com a romantic comedy, you know, uh, for Kithrea, a.k.a. Aphrodite. And therefore, you know, I'm going to write about something random that Pan would write. Mm, Liza. Yeah, I, I like that, that um, the muses won't speak to him and and... Uh, Aphrodite and the muse of history also won't speak to him, so he has to he has to resort to Pan, to the um, the the Pan pipe, the crudest and earliest musical instrument. But also, um, he does what a lot of authors do, uh, in that he uh, he renounces responsibility, in that he saying, you know, uh, our author, the prologue isn't the author, the prologue is someone else talking about the author. So our author found out one history, like old histories that are wisdom. And uh, this one, in, incidentally, is from Boccaccio's De Camerone. Um, I don't, I'm not sure where Boccaccio got it from or if he made it up. Uh, Eric and Enid, possibly, the Arthurian myth might be an antecedent. Anyway, um, so, uh, so so the author the author is saying, well, I'm, I'm just reinterpreting an older history. And then the other line is, and move it there to by his friend. Isn't it? And, and I didn't even want to write this. My friend made me. So, um, so uh, uh, he's hedging his bets if people like this play or not. Mm. Excellent. Uh, yes, a certain amount of hedging your bets is always, always a good way to start a play. Uh, lower everyone's expectations. Just push the expectations down uh, and they'll enjoy it so much more. Let's crack on with some action. Scene one, uh, we have the entrance of politic persuasion. So let's find out uh, what politic persuasion is like. Benedicite, sancte. Good Lord, where am I now? Uh, Mary, I may say to you I had a sudden fall. Even now I saw Venus milking a cow who took me by the hand and led me to her palace royal, where Cupid, her son, sat with his bow in hand like a manly archer his foes to withstand. She uh, spread the table and made me good cheer. We had cakes and cream, plentiful store. Ooh, but thence I was taken and carried by the hair and placed at the entry of Jupiter's door, who, peeping out at the keyhole, espied uh, my face, and with cap and knee welcomed my good grace. Lord, what solace was made at my entrance. Orpheus, the god of harmony, was sent for to supper. And Mercurius, for a present, a friend of mine old acquaintance brought to welcome me a dish of almond butter. St. Peter fried pancakes, a, good, a jolly good pace, and sent them as dainties to Jupiter's grace. There was no remedy, but I must lodge there all night. And in the morning, after breakfast was done, I was set on a horse which to my judgment and sight was snouted like a woodcock and bellied like a ton. But Lord, so he pranced from the top of Juno's tower, he carried me 300 miles in the space of an hour. But by chance coming to the pavilion of mighty Mars, Bellona, the goddess of battle in armor, was clad with 20,000 men waiting at her arse which sight so amazed me that as one distraught or mad, I spurred cut with my fury outrageous and, and fell, that he cast me headlong to, to the dungeon of hell. As a new-come guest, I was placed at Beelzebub's table, but such a sight of crab-tree-faced knaves were servitors there. I swear by mine honor, I use not to fable. They put my manly heart in a wonderful fear. But then, calling to Jupiter for his favor and grace, I was suddenly transported by his angel from that place and sat on my horseback even as I was before, and posting to and fro, my prancer fell on his knees even right against the entry of his glorious goodly door, who sat by the fireside eating of bread and cheese. 
Godspeed, quoth I, and quickly opened the gate, but he gaped greedily and bade me cease my prate. Thou wilt wake God Almighty and his angels out of their slumber. Nay, quoth I, thou art loath thy dinner to lose. But at that word, I swear by Saint Uncumber, he cast me down churlishly and liked to broke my nose. Through the thick clouds I had a marvellous fall that I had liked to break my neck on the top of Westminster Hall. But Charing Cross was my friend, and uh, cro caught my leg in his hand, the weathercock of Paul's to aid me to his flight, and between these two Frannians, you shall understand, I was set on my legs and rear it upright. The cross in cheap. For joy I escaped this ill-favored dance, did play on a bagpipe, and the standard did dance. Here let there be a clamour, with whooping and hallooing as though ye were hunting or chasing the game. And so at this point uh, we will very briefly pause, because um, that's such a fun speech. Well done, uh, Liza. Um, it's, um, yeah, it's speaking to me of uh, earlier kind of storytelling in... Uh, in plays, it's very John Haywardy. It has to I realized say. about um, halfway through that the right way to do it was as fast as possible. Yeah, it's this runaway story that you don't really want to be narrowing in on the the narrative too much. It's just things keep happening, and and yeah, it's some. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really fun way of opening. I don't know if it's going to have literally any connection with the rest of the play whatsoever, but um, it's a really good start. Um, uh, someone comes on stage and says, where am I? <laughs> the definitive answer uh, to the question, when you fell from heaven, did it hurt? Um, uh, other other thoughts or uh, uh, about this, uh, this opening, uh, Stephen? After that awful prologue, it's 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 really weird, isn't it? The the prologue seems to be as, as deliberately as bland as possible, and then we get this wonderful speech. You, you could have put a bit of jizz into the prologue, couldn't they? So I, I just wonder if that's a deliberate thing. It's a little bit of misdirection, perhaps, because the prologue was so sort or the preface or whatever it was was so so kind of by by numbers by the book, you know all the right mythological references um, as, oh gosh, I can't remember, somebody mentioned that. I've got a whole load of mythological references, but they're all about, you know, being cooked a pancake by Venus and that kind of thing. It's it's a brilliant contrast. Mm. Yes, that uh, yeah, maybe maybe the preface is is, uh, is sort of knocked down by the entrance of this character <laughs> in that sense, yes. Uh, other thoughts before we move on, uh, Eric? Yeah, there are so many. It just jumps from like Christian mythology to like well, or theology uh, to uh, sort of Greek slash Roman, Greco-Roman stuff. It, it goes from like Venus uh, having cakes and cream with, with uh, you know Saint Peter frying pancakes and then Jupiter's grace and so on and so forth. And I'm like, where is this place? I want to go there. <laughs> Yeah, and then at the end you get the mythology of London. You get, mm. uh, you know, per personifications of London places, which I think is also quite delightful. Mm. Uh, Stephen, well, it, it is a sort of Englishing of the mythology, isn't it? It's as if, as if the gods. You don't have to go to Greece. These gods are, uh, you know, just up in the sky up here. So obviously they're going to do cakes and cream because that's what we do. Mm. Um. Lovely. Uh, okay, let's um, have the entrance with uh, much uh, much whooping uh, of uh, presumably people in the middle of a hunt. Um, and uh, here we get uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, names that don't uh, match my speech prefaces, so I'm assuming that the Marquis is uh, uh, Enter Gortia, uh, Sanspiathedens, Reason and Sobriety. Even now, from haughty woods, where echoes silver sound, among the shrubs and valleys, lo, to skies doth forth rebound. Even since Aurora gan to show on earth fair Phoebus race, Diana's knights by earnest toil have followed the chase. The wandering book by staggering stroke launched from bloody bow, a nimble course of silly hounds hath caught the overthrow. 
to noble states the venal game of hunting doth pertain to recreate their tristy minds and make them joy again so we which long in secret close have kept the wall of town did judge it meet the chance to sue thereby to win renown a worthy wight i go to you am and marquis by descent Parents race, the parents noble, sanguine race, whose fame's most excellent in aureate trump, with cheerful voice through Europe blown hath been, whose just deserts in martial feats the laurel wreath did win. As they did safely rule, salute you's worthy town, so I their seed do fame achieve, who thundereth my renown. Speak on, my knightly knights, each one show forth your mind. If that in us through ruling state once faulty ye us find. As you most worthy wight can serve our countrymen from pain and seek salutius laws by toil and study to maintain. So we your liege men still consent your honour to obey. Insufficient are we noble lord thy virtues to display. Hunters quoth you. Mary, here's a goodly rabble. They have slain bucks as many as I'll hold in my hand. To eat venison the knaves be able, but the flesh they kill feeds in the sea sand. Uh, Godspeed you, Master Hunter. Have you killed any chucks? I believe your hounds have spoiled my beldam's ducks. What art thou thus unreverently dost prate? Either for what cause dost thou thyself thus misuse? Dost thou not blush, my honourable estate, thus shamelessly with scornings to abuse? Uh, first, to re-answer your former assertion, what am I? Nay, stay there, I know not myself. Uh, but you may see by my national, my, by natural condition, I am neither cosset, calf, calf, ox, nor elf. And neither the qualities of any brute beast can I put in your... Having such a thing amidst my face, I am sure. Thou seemest a merry companion to be. What is thy name? Declare unto me. My name? Body of God, I'm clean nipped in the head. My name? Why, where is it? What is it? Fled? Ah, name, quoth you. Marry, now I'm dressed in my kind. I'd rather than forty pence my name I could find. Hearest thou, fellow? What shall we call thee? Uh, even as you please, so let it be. Even as I please, I perceive thou dost dote. In faith, sir, my name is gone to hunt haddocks in Cock Laurel's boat. But I will not cease hunting as a hound doth for his prey till I have found it again by this good day. So, 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 lo, now seek all about, now search every hole within and without. Well sought! And now found at the last. Whew, I followed my chase wonderful fast. Would you know my name, sir? Show me with speed. I am called Politic Persuasion, indeed. Politic Persuasion, a name right excellent. And for our person very convenient. Wherefore, if thou wilt with us have residence, thou shalt be entertained using thy diligence. I thank you, and I will do so that my behaviour shall merit, I trust your love and favour. Well now, my servants, sith ye elevate my praise, for empery and rule, what other occasion resteth that should not augment our fame always, expressly to show it straight, make invasion? None that we know but one thing we desire, trusting in God that our reasonable petition, which of your honour we crave with hearts entire, shall be fulfilled hearing thereof definition. Say what you please, we do you freely licence. I cannot grant before I hear your sentence. Long time have we your servants heard, the commons muttering voice. Long time have we concealed the cause, why they cannot rejoice. Long time have we in secret close gushed forth our bitter tears. 
Long have we spent in doleful plaints these fragrant fertile years. The cause unknown to you we judge of this our messful cheer, which to redress prepare with speed to hear thy listening ear. Huh, for twenty pound, here is some broil toward. Now, politic persuasion, show forth thy skill. I will make him obstinate, stubborn, and froward, if that I may achieve my person, my purpose, and will. Why, friends, what thing should move you thus in secret to complain? Why should you keep from me the thing? It doth augment your pain. Of nature am I such a one that rigor's force do use. To give regard to your complaints, did I as yet refuse? Then why from me should ye thus hide the thing that causeth grief? Speak on, faint not, ostend your woe, doubt not to find relief. Honestly spoken, I swear by St. Anne. My master, you see, is a frank-hearted gentleman. We cannot cease but justly yield to the condign, con, to thee condignly praise, which gratefully re-answers us, the Lord prolong thy days, and... Grant the double Nestor's years tranquility and peace, that thou mayst rule and safely, safely reign with honors just increase. This is a goodly kind of salutation and a wonderful kind of regratulation. I am plain Dunstable, I may say to you. I am as only as the good wife that for love kissed her cow. This is the mean why we remain in pensive pained plight that in the cause and anguish doth our solace banish quite, that you in single state abide and marriage do refrain. What God, would God you would enjoy that yoke that swaggered were our pain, that should our messful hearts that long have subject been to woe, cast off the clog of heaviness and dreary tears forego? Then should our tristful minds exile their doleful, deadly care and joy infringe those grisly gulfs which doth our footsteps snare bones is all this entreatance for wiving some men are married and would be unwedded again and some men never uh, fall to thriving before they be spoused this is evident and plain but whosoever intendeth of that mystery to be taster findeth oft times the gray mare to be the better maester my friends, full friendly, I reply with protestation due that single life preferred is in sacred scripture to true. But happy are the married sort which live in perfect love. Twice happier are the single ones St. Paul doth plainly prove. For such as lead a virgin's life and sinful lust expel, in heaven above the ethereal skies with Christ their Lord shall dwell. We grant that scripture doth extol Vesta's savoury flower, and happy are the continent which rest within her bower, but yet for you more meet it were conjoined for to be, that after you your seed of rule might have the dignity, for where there is no issue left, the wise man saith plain, that every man in lordly state doth covet for to reign. Bow wows is no wedding, the proverb doth tell, Mary quoth you, I heard a many a one say that for the first the first day for wedding all other doth excel, for after they have not one merry day. <laughs> quoth the good wife, I would be uncoupled, and with sobs the same wished, for I shall never have health in my head while he hath pith in his fist. Saith the good man, I have such a shrew to my wife, I speak unfeignedly, I swear by God's mother I am half weary of this present life. To be rid, I would give the devil one half to fetch the other. Uh, I, I speak not generally, all run not this race. Uh, but some are ready to catch their husbands by the face. What joy should such as, such as subjects be to see this day possess? Content your minds if case I grant your state for to redress. You shall permit your worthy lord in choice to use his skill. And eat permit, as reason is, to marry whom I will. Choose where you please, take who ye list, we will you not gainsay. Then will I soon elect my mate, and time shall haste the day. 
Lo, now my lord will be married, we shall have a feast. But where is his wife? Can any man tell? He will have such a one, I judge at the least, whose beautiful countenance shall Helen excel. A fair girl, trick and in minikin trim, <laughs> a neat troll which in years shall be like unto him. Now, God of his grace in your choice send you good luck, and grant that your love may last for ever. I beseech God send you wither as many horns as a buck, that your tongue, her nose, and my tail may be joined together. What is that? Uh, uh, God grant that in love ye may continue together. Well, now let us depart this place. We'll wait. We will wait upon you. But any any of the other servants can uh, can uh, go for the both uh, line if they so choose. We will wait upon you by God's grace. Excellent, and you exit, leaving Politic on stage. Nay, I will follow after as fast as I can. For if I be missing, my lord lacks a man. And the stage is clear. Um, yeah, there's uh, there's an awful lot of question as to when precisely politic is doing his asides and when politic is talking to actual people it's and there's some which are sort of half heard by the marquis so he has to make up a uh, a, a more appropriate uh if i rump hold the bailey that um uh, yeah and uh, the this is just full of life it's doing all sorts of things um this whole thing of not remembering what your own name is and then finally coming out with a name that's that very much feels like it's from a, a morality play of any time in the previous 50 years. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's doing a lot of things. Um, in terms of uh, advancing the plot, uh, you politics gained a master and um, and the master is uh, plans to get married after some exhortations on that subject. So that's the plot so far. Thoughts, questions, issues, confusions, hopes, dreams. <laughs> Eric. I'm just wondering who would invite Reason on a hunt. <laughs> he doesn't seem like the kind of guy who would be like there to sort of support anybody unless like I know just yeah. Then again, I guess it makes sense in, in terms of the plot. We'll see. Well, if if we consider these things as aspects of uh, of uh, the Marquis's personality, then uh, then you know the, he's got sobriety and reason, which are you know probably good things when you're handling offensive weapons yeah and and fidance sans peur which is courage basically confidence without fear mm -hmm. i think i believe at least or fidance confidence or faith perhaps uh i anyway i agree with you rob that these are here to show the marquis's character well his character at this particular point in a juncture of the play of course uh uh, the, and and of course he's surrounded by all these good people and then suddenly this terrible person for for absolutely no discernible reason gets employed among them as a servant yeah it's really apparently in the early modern period it's really easy to get employed if you're a, a, a comedy a comedy rap scallion um i would have thought uh references and uh, and uh, uh fr from a, from a previous household would be more important but no um clearly uh, just a comedy bit comedy business that's that's what matters um so yes, uh, as this is a semi-allegorical um, sort of setup here, we've got uh, aspects of the uh, the uh, Marcus's personality who are literally wandering around uh, with him. Uh, and if we have a, a vice-like figure like Politic coming in, it may change the nature of who the Marquis is as the play progresses. Um, it uh, it so that that's the sort of that's the sort of game that we're playing here. Uh, it's I say the early 1560s. Uh, the, this is the kind of play that you get, uh, and uh, the genres are starting to shift and change. So it'll be interesting to see what else this play throws at us. It's been a while since we've done a play quite like this, so it's it's, it's getting the. I'm waiting for someone to pretend to have a different name. I suppose you could argue politics sort of does that, but just pretend by pretending not to know what his name is. So maybe a bit of that, Stephen. Well, that was what I was just going to uh, ask. Yeah, that the business with 
being completely blank about your name. Um, I, I'm, I was just wondering what kind of um, hints that might give for performance, because vices can be quite horrible. Um, uh, and, it, you know, you, you, on the one hand, you can do it as kind of comedy bumpkin, couldn't you? It's all, all that. Ooh, uh, uh, but um, there could be an element of deviousness or malignancy about it. And, I mean, at this point in the play, you can't really tell which way it's going to go, can you? But I think it's, it's, it's interesting that there's a little bit of suspense set up there, which is, uh, is there a reason why politic persuasion is not going, you know, are they going to say their name? what's going on here and then that that sort of balloon is punctured a little bit where he just goes oh yeah i'm politic persuasion he goes all right cool okay mm. yeah i i thought in fact that maybe it was written with a country bumpkin accent in mind some of the some of the rhymes uh indicated that but then those same rhymes you know you find them in other plays at other level of diction so i'm not sure how much is just a london op thing mm you and cow but then you often find you spelled with a w instead of a u uh in in texts of this period so yow 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 and cow yes um that, that that's probably where it, where it would be um absolutely other thoughts eric i'm just trying to work out how they went from like asking about politics name to getting the whole business about getting married or is that just like something that politic brings up and they decide to sort of talk about it's it's the other servants they bring it up uh the for the marquis the marquis says you know is there anything i can do for you essentially and they're like yeah you can do this for us get married <laughs> the, the marquis does do a bit of a sudden right well we've dealt with that business now we'll get on to the the, the you you have you you and you uh speak uh let's see where we are um and of course there is an element that this kind of play may be one of the problems we have with this kind of uh, interlude sort of text is that although this is a very long one um, is that it we don't have the the knowledge of the expectations of the genre you know to a degree we kind if you if you know your uh, earlier plays and plays that would be happening around it we kind of know who politic is the moment he says a, a name like politic persuasion we're going right we know we kind of know where he might be going um the fact that we've got these allegorical characters around it uh so it's, it's setting up expectations in an audience whether it subverts them i don't know so there is a there is a little bit of um that that world of the theater is slightly gone um it, it, for a modern audience and of course i always like to occasionally try and steer this back to the question of how we might do with this today so it's a so it's a, it's a practical question that uh, we we don't always have an answer for but it's a, a good question to ask any other thoughts before we move on to scene two? The scene has been set. Obvious thoughts as well as profound, deep uh, meditations are allowed. Uh, OK, we will move on to scene two. We will get to the title character. Um, so here enter Grizel singing and spinning with her parents and indignant poverty uh always like uh, some in indignant poverty uh you don't have to sing indigent the song. indigent sorry that's me just it's i've got my script is very very small letters um to save paper so and ink so uh, thank you thank you for correcting me there uh so grizel you don't need to sing uh but this is a song <laughs> that's good news for everybody <clears throat> God by his providence divine hath formed me of slimy clay. Then why should I in aught repine or seek his will to disobey? Be it far from me to do such ill as to contend against his will. Sing dandily, distaff and dandily, ye virgins all come learn of me. Let children to their parents give obedience due as they are taught, and then and they on earth full long shall live and joy the place which Christ hath Bought, with his heart blood and deadly wound where lasting joys shall i abound sing dandily distaff and dandily let children all come learn of me though eat us on my parents here on my parents here by crooked shape have shown his power yet i am bound to dread and fear them tide and time and every hour 
for God to me hath given such charge as in his law it seem it is seen at large. Sing dandily, distaff, and dandily, each child with speed come learn of me. Set nature's laws before your eyes, which may your tender minds constrain, all crooked language to despise, and mend your miss for fear of pain. The stubborn child the Lord doth threat, in hell to chaste with torments great. Dandily distaff and dandily, ye virgins all come and all come learn of me. Conserve and keep virginity, your conscience do not pollute, but walk in true integrity, all sinful lust do clean confute. Fly such men as would you allure, to spot with lust your lives so pure. Dandily distaff and dandily, ye virgins all come learn of me. Obey such men as you do serve, use diligence at all assays. Then fame her trumpet will preserve, to thunder forth to skies your praise. From filthy speech your tongues refrain, let godliness in you remain. Dandily distaff and dandily, ye virgins all come learn of me. How do you, my parents? I pray you declare. Well, good daughter, God be praised. Truly, I thank God that merry ye are. I have missed, uh, I missed indigence. I didn't even notice indigence having a, having a, uh, uh, a, 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 a line. So, uh, Stephen, could you please uh, briefly step in to read indigence, please? Uh, muted at present. Oh, how joyful would I be if God in my age had raised me such a child to comfort my needful indigence. She never ceaseth toiling, but laboureth alway showing to you the fruits of true obedience. For her birth, good neighbours, be joyful ye may, for to your hoary heads she is a perfect stay. In youthful days, when sappy youth his blossoms did display, when every limb, for want of strength, through green years had no stay, my parents here, were ca my parents here still careful were, their child with food to nourish. As duty was, so nature wrought, they did me ever cherish. From tender days to this estate, by pain they have me brought. And now that age hath clogged them both, to comfort them I ought. But yet my pain unable is, their pains to recompense, whose studies still employed were, to save from inconvenience. Their only child they fostered ought, with sustenance full due, and should I now ungrateful with vile disdain pursue no god forbid that through my fault i should their griefs increase to labor still to comfort them these hands shall never cease ah my dear child whose flowering youth in virtue still doth flourish our hoary heads if thou wert not for food were like to perish our backs were like for want of cloth extreme cold to abide but thou for us continually by labour dost provide thy diligence my neighbours all can justly forth report thou art thy parents only stay and staff of their comfort Rissel, i pray thee to my talk give good heed thou seest thy father is lame and i very old cease not as thou hast begun to comfort his need for the pangs of death on me have taken hold I feel myself very sick, increased is my pain, not now but the ground can make me fain. Good mother, comfort yourself, be of good cheer. You shall not you shall want nothing your pains to assuage. Let not sickness cause you anything to fear, for that may be a mean to enlarge your do dommage. Dear child of thy wanted care and diligence, thy father and I have perfect intelligence, whose age see thou hold in worthy estimation. Love and obey him, give him true veneration, then God will bless thee with his spirit and grace. 
Yea, on earth thou shalt long run thy race, but be not high-minded, let not pride infect thee, lest God in his wrath with his scourge correct thee. Be no pink pick thank, seek not the fruits of distension, be rather a peacemaker to banish contention. Be slow to speak, let th let thy words be witty. For for a damsel to have many words it is unfitty. Let love and obedience in thy heart be truly placed. Let contumulous disdain be utterly defaced. Grudge not in aught against thy father's will, but always be ready to his mind to fulfill. And show thyself of a good godly behavior, that of God and man thou mayst merit the favor. Mother, all that you have said shall observed be. Oh, dear wife, how is it with thee? Even as it pleases, pleaseth God, good husband Janical, but flesh and blood is very frail and brittle, for such was the cause wherefore mankind was framed. But hope is my staff which fleshly affection hath tamed, wherewith through Christ my only justification. I drive against sin, death, and damnation, and even amidst the bitter pangs of death, whose gripes most sharp seem to close my breath, I appeal to Christ for mercy and grace, trusting among his saints in the heavens to have place. Alas, poor man, increased in that is thy pain. Just cause hath thou to languish and complain. Good neighbor, I am heartily sorry for your sickness, but comfort yourself, brother Janical. Let go your heaviness. Come on, dear mother, stay on my shoulder. Let us depart this place. You shall want nothing to comfort you withal. I know not that thou wilt respect my case. How be it that I am glad? Uh, how be it I am glad that death to me is before? For now uh, shall I, as a pil pilgrim from, from pilgrims' travel, be free, and through Christ enjoy heavenly felicity. Well. Being fully furnished with anguish and pain, I will to my cottage to comfort my wife, this is plain. And I will bear you company with all festination, doing all I may to turn your joy to, to joy, to, to, to doing all I may to turn to joy your lamentation. And the tautology uh, uh, leads off with the rest of the uh, the uh, family unit. Uh, I like the note of dear mother, stay on my shoulder. Let us depart. You know, let 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 me help you up because uh, uh, obviously we don't have any uh, way of uh, getting sick people on and off stage uh, with with any kind of equipment. Um, so yeah, we have a song. We have a family situation. Mother's not looking well. Uh, that's 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 not looking like that's going to that's going to end uh, cheerfully, and uh, father and daughter and and a, and a neighbour uh, who's uh, uh, seen and possibly never seen again. Uh, thoughts on the room. Uh, Liza. Well, I don't know when this play dates from. Do you, Rob? Fifteen sixty one. Very the very beginning of Elizabeth's reign. But it certainly makes me think of uh, the scene where you find the women in, I think, Rafe Royster Doyster, where they're singing and spinning. Mm. And and I think... It's very close. It's very close. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's that universe, you know, we, we don't necessarily... We haven't really reached that sort of uh, universe of uh, Elizabethan theatre as we think of it. This is still very much on that slightly earlier mould. Uh... Yeah. But I also feel like maybe it illustrates, I mean, we know all kinds of work songs for the work that is coded male in this era, for sailors, for, for field workers, um, although field workers were done by people of all genders. Um, and and I, I think spinning songs might have also been a thing, um, that spinning was sort of a rhythmic activity and, and as, a, you know, like like a lot of sailing work was so um maybe spinning songs spinning songs were an actual social thing that people did mm. anyway it's very nice to have grizel's character um illustrated in this this very very graceful verse that she sings mm. 
Sing dandily, distaff and dandily, let children all come learn of me. Um, uh, Eric. I was particularly troubled by um, the, where is, where is it? Um, the stubborn child the Lord doth threat in hell to chase with, with torments great. And I'm like, well, that's not ideal. <laughs> Ch chased as in chasten, I think, as in, as in, you know, punish. Mm. To chastise. Um, yes, yes. There's, uh, the, yeah, the, 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 the early modern period is, uh, is not subtle with its, uh, its uh, uh, child rearing sometimes. Um, we've had other plays where physical violence is the standard, uh, how to make children learn. Um, so, and threats of uh, hellfire and damnation. That, that, that seems like a perfectly legitimate method to uh, get, get the buggers to work. Um, can't do it these days. Um, I'm going to keep waffling until someone, someone has a cogent point that's something to do with the play. Eric. Well, also to add to that, you've got like the mother going, yes, be your father and do, you know, uh, follow basically what God has set out and stuff. Um, which seems a bit like overkill after Grissel has sung this song about like being, you know, sort of doing exactly that. Hmm. Uh, other thoughts uh, about this uh, this unit, uh, this this family, this this sort of odd hanger on as well. Uh, Indigence um, is 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 this sort of. Uh... I, mean, I I I I I don't know how they how they function within this scene precisely. Um... You know, just just saying. Oh, I wish I had a child like yours. Uh, isn't she great? Uh, seems to be a primary dramatic function, which I suppose the parents would automatically think anyway. So it's nice to have outside appro uh, approval of that thought. Uh, other things. Uh, we've we've met two major characters. Uh, Rachel, are you uh, are you? Uh... Yeah. Um, no, I was just looking at this song because I was trying to see what songs like how they composed them back then just by the syllable um count i was just looking at the first two stanzas it's just very different i guess from you know the way that that uh i don't know like a pop song is put together now just the the the, the form that is all it's i don't know I don't know how to explain it because I was just going through it right now and it's my first time cool, thinking cool. of a song in a play like this. Uh, Stephen, I think. Uh, yeah, we're just, uh, I was just wondering after your last point, Rob, I wonder if the point of indigence is, um, is to stress uh, Gristle's reputation in the sense that, you know, a good woman in this period is recognised as good by the community. And it's something to do with, with, you know, that her virtue is not merely recognised by her parents, but some somebody outside the household who kind of confirms and, and, and stresses that over again. So it's an it's another kind of building block in, in uh, the character reference for her. Mm. Uh, and structurally, the play has given us two scenes that set up um, major characters. We've got a scene setting up the Marquis. Uh, no spoiler that that's going to be a major character. Uh, politic, of course, uh, and and here uh, Griselle. Uh, we'll see whether the other characters in that scene will uh, be important. Eric, I'm just wondering if Indigence is actually um, Grissel's uncle, or if that's just um, like brother being a sort of term of endearment, or or like literally brother, because um, he refers to er, well, Indigence refer or aunt. I'm not sure. <laughs> gender wise um but uh, yeah because indigence goes good neighbor i'm heartily sorry for your sickness which presumably is to the mother and then but comfort yourself brother janical let go your heaviness so i don't know mm. if that's like a member of the family or not well so, uh, swapping who they're, they're addressing that dialogue is uh to mid 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 flow um um yeah um, it, it does seem to be an outsider just by the way that flows, but um, uh, maybe there'll be more information later on. Uh, okay, we have scene three coming up. Uh, we're returning to uh, the Marquis's uh, gaff. 
Politic is in attendance. Uh, we don't really have any stage directions for this scene, uh, but there is Politic, there is Marquis, there is Fidence, there is Reason, there is Sobriety, all the, uh, the usual suspects who we met earlier. So return for a second pass at the audience. Uh, so let us see what happens here. Politic speaks first. Ay, Mary, now all is as it should be. Uh, Godsy good morrow, Gam. I trow you will say that uh, well-nurtured I am. Uh, but yonder is such tidings as will make you glad. The Marquis for marriage, I trow, will run mad. For all his mind, I tell you, without any let, to praise his spouse, I promise you, is set. Ye shall hear anon how he will lift her up to skies as though there were none more witty, more virtuous, or wise. I cannot blame him, though he commend his own, but to none of his court the gentlewoman is known, and therefore to wonder their minds I incense, so that every man longeth to view the lady's presence. Oh, this heart does long to spread my lady's fame, and yet my tongue unable is to lord that worthy dame. For beauty I to Helen may aptly the maid compare, such Virtues in a youngling's breast is seldom seen or rare. A Thillis for her constant truth, a Thisbe for her love. Her arguments most pithy do, her virtues daily proof. For beauty, quoth you, is she so amiable to the eye? Are her, are her virtues superabundant that they cannot be told? I say, no more tract of time the thing shall try. I think such a wife would very well be sold. Uh, you may course her if it like you, and perhaps catch a worse. The pride of some dames maketh the husband bear an empty purse. They must be trimmed after the trickest fashion. Fine waters must be brought for beauty's preservation. Then here with a bodkin, th their hair with a bodkin must be curled after the finest guise. Their neat's tongues with peaks must hang over their eyes. And to make them seem proper headed, fine caps they have, such as will scantly cover the crown, I think, as God may save. But to make them sit clean, I swear by St. Anne, they cut off their hair, as I'm an honest man. Somebody can tell that I use not to lie, and I warrant you, ye shall some of these tricks in her espy. Truth, such pride in the world is now resident, as in no time the like hath been seen with eye. Many men and women, I judge, are impudent for Im impudence, sorry, uh, for pride they embrace with miserful greed greedy. As God for pride did plague Sodom and Gomorrah in his ire, so will he destroy the wicked with flaming fire. I know that pride embrace it is, and some their state exceed. But my elected mate, God knows, with vice will not proceed. She will observe a modest mean, her virtues shall increase. All hateful hate in her shall end, she loveth perfect peace. She feareth God, she dreads his name, she leads a godly life, and daily seeks for to subdue contention and strife. She will as duty binds, her spouse had made obey, from husband's hests at no time she for any course will stray. If she be so holy a saint as you make her, refuse her, I beseech you, and I myself will take her. Uh, such a marriage would I have if I should choose, then should I be sure she would not me misuse. I might say what I would and do what I list. He that hath such a wife of God, he is blissed. But most wives are so nappish and cutted now that they will be known to bear rule, I say to you. Rule, quoth I, yea, and more than reason doth require. Yea, and especially after that to mastership they aspire. Then huff all ahoy, their tongues must be taunting. The flag in the topmast needs must be flaunting. And now and then, I swear by all hallows, the nubbins be so nice they will eat no mallows. So coy are the mincing muses that drink of Bellona's well, that oft times they conquer their husbands in battle. Yea, and now and then, I swear by this light, betwixt them on her part is proclaimed open fight. God send the grey mare footing and to amble apace, 
for now and then her ten commandments are seen in the good man's face. This talk from a malicious mind doth proceed, therefore cease this vain clatter. I tell you plain that some wives resemble the cockatrice indeed. I speak plainly, I cannot flatter. Think not that envy doth give me occasion. No, their natures be known to politic persuasion. Try who try them who will, shall my words true find. Some of them, I tell you, be stubborn and unkind. Deny them of their wiles, and then you mar all. You shall see what thereafter is like for to fall, either brawling, jowling, snapping, or snarring. Their tongues shall not cease, but always be jarring, or else they will counterfeit a kind of hypocrisy, and simper like a fermenty pot, and their finger shall be in their eye, and they say love is forgotten, though my love be shown. I see you love another better than your own. <laughs> Tush, tush, I know full well their meaning and intent. They be the craftiest cattle in Christendom or Kent. Well, set all these words apart, dear friend. Though some be froward, all do not frowardness condescend. For I of marriage know the just probation, and doubtless my wife, wife leadeth an honest conversation. Uh, yeah, but sometimes you give her her own will. Yea, and reason. Or else, I warrant you, your ears with brawlings she would fill. If the good wife should not sometimes bear all the stroke, throughout the house she would raise such a smoke that either bitterly her tongue should run at large, or else her eyes should fountains of tears discharge. Tush, whole bushels of tears fall from their eyes. The syrup were notable to save her warden pies. But if self-will were bridled, then men should live at rest. With womanly actions, they should not be oppressed. <clears throat> my subjects now, whose long desire doth wish my marriage day, shall have the thing that they expect without longer delay. Wherefore, my knights, yourselves bedeck in sumptuous array to solemnize without all let this long desired day. O oh, noble lord, with willing mind we grant to do the same. We will apparel ourselves that the world shall speak of your fame. Tomorrow next I will fetch home my spouse. Uh, by my troth, if it like your honour, she's a handsome blouse. Jill Sparrow that milked Goodman Peach's cows. I said I would fetch home my lady with celerity. And I'll wait on you. This is the verity. I will go with you as duty doth bind me. And I of your company will be glad, if, and if ever I can an old blanket find, I hope for my part to be handsomely clad. What sayest thou? Uh, I say, after dinner a banquet shall be assigned, notable fare in your hall shall be had. Go on, let us depart with speediness. To do, do as you will, will as we be, be in, readiness. in readiness. In readiness. Yes, the joy of trying to say a line simultaneously on Zoom. Uh, all to do as you will as we w uh, be in a readiness. Exuant everyone except for politic persuasion. Nay, fare you well, God be your speed. I tell you I come after as fast as I can. Uh, I'm a goodly fellow to help at a need. Nay, by mine honour, I'm a handsome serving man. Well, I will go post to fetch home his wife, whose virtues, as he saith, are wonderful rife. God ill you, God thank you for my friendly company. I must needs be packing, I swear by St. Antony. Uh, fare you well. God be with you, gentle friends, adieu. <laughs> I'm the properest fellow that ever man knew. And exit. And uh, yes, so there's a wedding coming. So what does politic uh, persuasion do? He spends all his time saying how terrible wives are. Uh, I mean, tact. Tact is a wonderful sense of tact and occasion there. Um, yeah. Ooh, doorbell, one second. <laughs> and that's politic persuasion uh, gone. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's it, it's nice that uh, the other people in the room do not agree with the opinions of political persuasion, and it's good, nice that we are clearly 
as an audience not really supposed to agree with politic persuasion because otherwise that would be quite awkward um uh, so yeah it 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 there's a sort of moments when uh, i think Fiedens has this line which I, I i wrote in my in the margin and shush now um as basically what you were saying there you know uh, the, yeah set set all these words apart that's 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 a nice that and and uh yeah he continues talking more asides from politic as well um or half asides that people half hear and people reasons sort of going and what was that um make up something that sounds similar but is different uh eric I was quite fond of the line, cease this vain clatter. <laughs> it seems like something you should just say to someone, like uh, in a daily sort of context. Uh, like, yeah. uh, maybe it sounds familiar as well. It might be a semi commonplace -y kind of thing. It's, it, it, it has a ring to it. Um, to it. I mean, I have to say, I'm still get, I'm still getting those, those, those half sort of uh, Haywardy vibes out of this. And but uh, other playwrights of the period as well. There's, there's a real. But there's a real difference in the energy between the politic scenes and the uh, the, the Griselle scenes. Um, some of the dialogue in the Griselle scene, less Griselle herself, but some of the others, it, it's a bit flatter. Uh, I don't know if it's just simply they've just got the patter right for the actor of politic and they just therefore flowed better. I don't know. Uh, it may... Liza. It may simply be the old morality play thing that it's more fun to write vice than virtue. Um... But, I mean, I do like, I think some of Griselle's dialogue has a very sort of understated grace to it. It's, it doesn't fall flat for me. Um, oh, it it's not as pyrotechnic, but it, it's, uh, you know. It, it was more Janikel. There was one line, you know, well being fully furnished with anguish and pain, I will to my con uh, cottage to comfort my wife, this is plain. Um, you know, it, there, every there are, rhyme can't be good. Yeah, there, there's just a few lines in that scene where which which just sort of landed with a slight slight more of a thunk to it. Um, didn't didn't he say something like, "Let your"? I'm trying to scroll up and find it. Um, Let I thy might words. Know the one yes, where where they use the word unfitty as yes. a, to make the rhyme. That made me cringe Witty so hard. Unfitty. That was mother. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 yeah, it, it certainly rang out to me. Um, but we will see. I mean, I guess what it is is that politic is that trying to sow distrust of women in general and wives in general. Um, and the audience has to be shown plainly that Griselle is trustworthy and, and is not, as politic describes women, politics seems to be one of these, you know, one of these Reddit guys or, or you know, MRAs or whatever. Feminist. Um, uh, other thoughts in the room, uh, Rachel. I um, there was some other play we did where it was saying um, that when we were doing Taming of a Shrew, that I said it was kind of like an anti-romance, like it was like somebody saw the the you know, tropes of the day. And they just said, I want to go against that completely and just make this like, oh, you think there's going to be some turnaround and now it just gets like more over the top. Um, I feel like this is kind of an, I don't know. I feel like politics, a little bit of an anti morality play character, like he's a vice, but this is an anti vice play. Like he's, He's trying to shame people, but nobody's taking this shaming and nobody wants to hear like this bashing. And yeah, because he, he doesn't have a posse. He's just this lone figure just saying stuff. Um, where, whereas normally the vice sort of has a posse that he's got to try and keep together and fails and they all start arguing and, and have physical violence, whereas... Yeah, it just feels like a really, really misguided stand-up routine. Um, uh, did, did you have more, Rachel? Sorry, I did sort of slightly step on you. Uh, I just... I feel like from the first scene that he was coming in and he was giving his long thing, I feel like that's a very physical monologue and maybe there's some, you know, physical clown stuff and that's... that we're supposed to see this sort of attitude, like... You know what Liza just said, like this MRA attitude, and and just think that, 
this is kind of a funny and weird way of thinking. Hmm. Uh, Eric. I was going to say, there is one play where we had a sort of vice that didn't really have a posse, but kept making posses and failing to maintain them. Uh, common conditions. <laughs> Who just like sort of decided, I'm going to ruin everybody's life by telling lies. And um, sort I of... see just... no pirates. Yeah, there's yeah, no pirates. If there's no pirates, then... You I know, know, it's very the... sad. But that's that's not uh, that far away in, in terms of the future as well. It's only a few years away before that turns up. So, um, yeah. Um, any additional thoughts, Bryony? I'm just wondering if anybody, because I'm so new to all of this whole mm. subject, genre, everything, um, if anyone can shed any light on the Jill Sparrow bit, because obviously I know I know what Sparrow is in Old English. It's, um, it's my surname, so I do know where it comes from. But I, I just wondered why one of my relatives is in the play if anyone knows that that is such a good question i that that you're right that line bounces out um because it's, it's a job title obviously isn't it it's for fletcher people that put the flights on arrows um, yes but she's but milking a cow so I, yeah she but, is maybe maybe sparrow is um I guess maybe it's more a comparison to the bird, uh, something, you know, small and drab but musical, um, a sort of a rustic thing. I'm just spitballing here. I'm going to have to do some internet searching on this. That's a really good prompt. And if we don't come up with an answer, the viewers at home, you put something in the co uh, comments. Do 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 tell us, because you know the, the internet is all about sharing knowledge and passive aggressive abuse. So uh, do 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 let us know uh, what uh, if if we're uh, being uh, very very missing something very obvious. So do 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 put a comment in. Um, other thoughts. No. Okay. Well, I fed the trolls, so uh, let's move on to scene four. Uh, so we have the return. Uh, structurally, it's a very straightforward uh, uh, structure of the play so far. Uh, we've had Marquis, Grissel, Marquis, and we're back to Grissel for scene four. Ah, Grisel, now mayst thou complain, infortune thine, alas, thy tender days in deadly dole, thou now must learn to pass, for thou hast lost a jewel great, whose like is rare to find, whose want to wail unto thine eyes a flood of tears is signed. Th thou, th thou now art motherless become, the grave her lodge doth rest, whose death to mourn with sobbing shrieks and sighs you now art pressed. Was never child had greater loss, nor cause of carking care. Help me to weep all such, alas, that careful children are. For I, alack, do miss my joy, and best instructress found. I rest alive, but she by death lieth close, closed fast in ground. Wherefore, ye muses nine, that on Parnasso rest, Calliope, Terescora, and Cleo, do your best. Strain forth your notes of wailful woes, weep you and mourn with me, that gods and men my inward grief apparent now may see. And here Grisel singeth a song to the tune of Damon and Pythias. Oh, that one. Yeah, yeah, that, that one. It's, it's, come on, we all know it. Um, you don't need to sing. Sing along at home, guys. Can all my poor can my poor heart be still? Can I possess sweet peace when Jove hath given part just the change, my blissful joys to cease? Judge you may cause you tender youths that gained your mother's love, and you shall find to mourn and weep, Dame Nature doth me move. My mother was bliss, her sight did banish care, but now to weep and mourn alack, her absence I prepare. I miss her counsels sweet to me, thrice blessed, ha thrice blissed happy dame, who trained me up in virtue's school that I may purchase fame. 
And when that Atropos came stealing on apace to see how she in tender arms her Grizel did embrace, my tears like fountains rushed out to show my grief and pain, whose want to wail in woeful wise nature doth me constrain, and she the heavens hath won, and with the saints doth reign, in endless bliss where Christ our Lamb doth her revive again. And I am left behind to live with my sweet father dear, to whom whilst life shall reign in me, reign in me, obeisance I will bear. And that's the end of the song and Grissel exits. So uh, we've had effectively a stand up routine from politic. And here we get Grissel's lament. Uh, her mother has has passed on uh, sad things uh, to uh, to uh, the, the, the tune of Damon and Pythias. Uh, before we go into the next scene. Um, yeah, thoughts about Grissel here. Um, uh, Eric. It's kind of like the play we saw this afternoon where they kind of have like the comedy scenes and then immediately right after you have a sort of monologue that is very sort of heartfelt and um, full of emotion. Mm, yes, changing up the uh, 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 ringing in the changes in terms of tone and uh, and sweep. Um, uh, it's also an interesting question as to maybe it's also partly to do some structural things about arranging it so that some people can get changed into different costumes, especially if they. Uh, I mean, there, there is sort of another scene to do that as well that follows this, but uh, it might be, and it might not. Who knows? We'll see where we go. Uh, other thoughts, uh, Liza. Just that the song um, and the and the scene in general emphasize uh, th uh, they emphasize duty um, that Grissel owes the you know your your model or ideal person owes a duty to their parents and, and that that you know she'll be dutiful to her husband as well when she marries. Mm. Uh, Brian. even even more so, I agree, but even more so, like it's that it's pleasure in duty. It's it's not like I'm obliged. I have to do this. It's you know it's like I of course I'm going to do this. They they did all this lovely stuff for me, um, but I just love. Uh, she's got some really nice language. It's nice to read her. There's some alliteration and just beautiful. It's just fun. Uh, Stephen. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that we we've got this sort of solo spot, as it were, which is a sort of. Uh, you know, the song, because, you know, the cliche about early modern women, you know, at least in certain accounts, is that they should be chaste and obedient and silent. Uh, and uh, I think the song is a way of getting round that in a sense, isn't it? Because it's silent in company. You know, the, the idea is you should just be sort of quiet and speak when you're spoken to and, and so on and so forth. And there's, you know... Just thinking about how we do that now, it'd be really difficult, I think, to to get an audience buy into that as an I ideal woman, as it were. But I think the song um, opens up a different kind of space. Um, it you know it, t it takes it out of a, a, a it, it gives her a sort of it gives us a sense of uh, the the interior interior life, which has already been said. But I think just sort of dramatically, I think it's interesting that. As it were, she speaks, but in song. Mm. Uh, okay, we have another short scene coming up. Uh, Liza, I did see a hand earlier, oh, an expectation to speak earlier. Um, uh, did you want to dive in? Oh, no, uh, I put it in chat. It's just uh, the, uh, the boy who played Grissel must have had a really beautiful voice. Yes, uh, they, they, they tended to get them from choir, choir, choir uh, boys, so um, yeah, that would make sense. Uh, so, scene five is relatively short. We have two lackeys. We have a couple of servants um, saunter in, uh, first servant and second servant. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, let's let's hear from them. I said it. My master is gone to my Lord Marquis' place, and I have been, I by his side have posted a pace. And so have I by, by mine. I swear by God's mother, I warn thee I sweat for, so that every drop uh, overtaketh over other. Oh, true. So let me see. Sure is a mad smell. 
All the place saviors of thy name's Greece, I see well. Gog's blood, knave, art thou knaving by kind? A greasier knave than thyself a man cannot find. Oh, cry you mercy, gentlemen. Can you bide no board? I'll trap thee about the costard with the hilts of my sword. Art thou knaving of me, hence, dastardly fool? That's I have seen as a wise man as you wear a hood and a colour. I, am I a fool? Gog's heart, Jack Sauce. I shake you by the ears. Go prate with thine equals, you horse and foolish boy. Gog's flesh, here's more to do with Jack and Apes than twenty bears. So that's good man, man, you need not be so coy. Blood, shall I be flouted of a baggage boy? I bid thee hold thy prate, but for wearing thy master's pantables, I would beat thee about the pate. About my pate, not a rush for thee, I do not care. <laughs> Spare not me, master man, but do what you dare. Then I will bob you, you patch, be a mox. <laughs> be, be well assured thou shalt bear me some knocks. Exit servants hitting each other. Um, that's not in the stage direction. I assume that it's just a constant uh, back and forth thing. Uh, I was talking about the possibility of uh, uh, things being in place to uh, break up between scenes. This this really does feel like a uh, a scene break so that Grissel can exit and then come back on again some time has passed. Um, do we really gain any... Uh, you know, they talk, obviously, uh, um, many things. Do they add anything... Plot-wise, or um, uh, what are we getting from this scene? Clowns! We love clowns! Send in the clowns! Well, I'm not even sure it's clowning. They just basically hit each other. Um... <laughs> that counts. In this day and age, that counts. <laughs> They've uh, been Brian. verbally bashing women more than enough. I think we need some man-on-man man man violence. Mm. Yeah, I th uh, yeah, uh, I think, uh, and it is it is very much par for the course. Um, the the level of physical, uh, uh, especially when they're, they're servants as well. Servants injuring themselves is just always always seems to be the way for Tudor comedy. That's just what 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 happens. So um, okay, I, I I don't think we need to linger on these servants particularly, unless there's anything anyone any lines or anything that particularly leapt out at you, Eric. I was just going to say that it's kind of that thing where we had this, uh, well, you know, with Ledgelo and Pendulo in um, Rare Triumphs of Love and Fortune, but it just feels like much less elegantly done. Well, yeah, I, mean, I, th I think we, uh, with Love and Fortune that we did this afternoon, uh, we're doing this week, uh, a later play, um, there is a deliberate comedy business that is being set up and played with and characters that are doing. These are, t these are two servants who come in and do some stuff. Uh, I don't know if we're going to ever see them again. I, I don't know if that's a spoiler. Um, you know, I don't know if you're all hankering to hear from these two these two people, but uh, I kind of am, really. Are you? Are you now? Um, okay, so we're going to go into scene six. I don't know how far we're going to get into scene six. I'm just sort of going to let it run and see where I hunt for a logical pausing place because I don't know if we're going to complete it. Uh, we shall see. So scene six, um, we uh, have the return of Grisel. Now that my spinning ended is, and house full cleanly made, to void the gulfs of idleness and use some honest trade, to well springs where the crystal streams of waters still increase, with prone and ready willing mind to go I may not cease. For I will fetch from thence with speed some dulcome water sweet and dainty broth for parent make as fitly is and meet. It is the duty of a child her father's age to love, to nourish him as he did me, it doth me now behove. In arms full oft he lulled me, and food he oft and food me often gave. Then why should I in any jot of duty him deprave? For God full straightly hath given charge to honour him a right, which precept I will I observe to outmost to utmost of my might, and hastily from well return to comfort him with food. Warm meats are meat for aged folk to nourish up their blood. 
and we can infer some action from Grisel. Enter Marquis, uh, lords and ladies. Come on with me, ye worthy whites, which I deserve renown. Ye nobles, all which I rested within Seleucia's town, most gratefully I yield you thanks for this your taken pain. God permit to length my life, I will requite again your friendly hearts with friendliness that friendship fruits ye show, the fullness of the same in time on you I will bestow. As duty binds, so love constrains us on you to attend. Your honour's gentle, your honour's gentle nature doth such love to us extend. That love inflames our gentle hearts to honour you aright and to advance thy high state uh, to at most of our might. Can con congenially we to thee, O Lord, our offered service give, beseeching Jove that sittest above the heavens, you long may live in prosperous state to comfort ours, then shall our joy increase, and ache, salutius, love shall reap through you the fruits of peace. I give you thanks assuredly from depth of the secret heart. And turns to the ladies. Ye matrons, all ye ladies fair, like thanks I do impart. To you whose pregnant minds such clemency bestow as doth belong to gentle hearts, like friendliness to show. Wherefore, nature doth urge me still to show your worthy praise, shown largely to me, youthful white of these my tender days, which thus much have respected me to deck with rich renown your governor and only lord, which rules Seleucia's town. I mean in that ye ready are attendance due to give, and to fetch home my mate elect, with whom in love I live. And let there be no. two or three ladies. No more but duty we do show, wherefore your mind content. To honour you with reverence due, we ladies all be bent. Uh, here we can infer the return of Grisel. Now that my pot to brinks I have filled, I will haste me home with all convenient speed. God grant I may do as my mother me willed, then God will prosper me in time of need. Let all children be mindful of obedience indeed. Fly self-will, which doth stubbornness engender. To honour your parents do daily remember. Be they never so poor or indigent, if God have blessed thee with store and increase. Remember the paps of thy mother give, gave thee nourishment. To feed and clothe thee, their care did never cease. Re relieve and comfort them so end thy days in peace if not look for god's scourge and cursed malediction which shall fall upon thee for thy stubborn infection well i will home with my water pot without delay i would be loath to offend my father with long tarriance for such as provoke their friends to ire day by day cannot escape god's terrible vengeance godspeed damsel soft wither away Truly, my lord, homeward, as fast as I may. Where is your father? Express to me with speed. In his poor cottage he resteth indeed. Haste, and tell him with all festination that with him his lord will have communication. Your commandment with speed performed shall be. I will return quickly, your honour shall see. Good father, be not yet be not offended with me, I you desire because so long from you I have been absent. So uh, we may have had uh, the uh, Grisel turning very quickly to earning, and her father is magically there. We don't have any entrance points for the father. Janikal uh, has, has popped in. Ah, daughter Grisel, why shouldst thou such a thing require? Thou art returned very soon in my judgment. Not so, good father, for coming by the way, I had an occasion and was forced to stay. My Lord Gautier, of our governor excellent, whom courteously I saluted with words reverent, willed me to haste home to my habitation, who stayeth hereby with you to have communication. Wherefore, good father, without longer delay, let us repair to his presence as fast as we may. Oh, dear child, I will haste to him with diligence. God grant he may relieve our indigence. 
O oh, honorable Lord, God send the felicity, thy whore, thy whore headed subject, thy person doth, rever doth reverence. Right worthy lords, God bless you with prosperity and shield you fair ladies from all convenient inconvenience. Oh, Johnny Cole, we thee re-greet again in friendly wise that God protect both thee and thine that sits in the ethereal skies. Incline thy aged ears to me, my loquy will prepend, hark, mark, and give regard to that I shall ostend. Requite my friendly heart, and gratify again thy lord, which for thy daughter here doth suffer extreme pain, who knoweth the pangs of love, or feels her passions dire, what living white more than myself abideth Cupid's ire. Such is the force of ardent fire that boils in secret breast. So severe is the darted wound with which I am oppressed, that my poor bleeding heart doth faint and comfort none can find, except that you do grant a salve to ease my doleful mind. O oh God, who would have thought that such a noble heart would have been set on flaming fire by blind by blinded Cupid's dart. Assouge your filthy lust, fly Venus wanton ways. Oh, mortify your appetite, do not regard her plays. Abhor her careless court, her muster books askew. So shall you quench that flaming fire, which gives you cause to rue. So shall you staunch the wound, wherewith your heart is pained. So shall no spark of grief be left, but parfait health be gained. Know that I mind not to pollute the chaste virginity, but rather seek the loss of life to keep integrity. I am not Venus darling, I, her court I do not use, to be enrolled in her books, my senses all refuse. Her bestial plays I hate, her pleasures filthy are. Disloyal lust cannot attempt to trap me in his snare, but from profounded heart doth perfect love proceed. Now, condescend to save or spill, grant mercy to my meed. If case your love be faithful pure, your love deserveth praise. Right sovereign Lord, respect your young and tender days, your noble state, your dignity, your honour and your name, your worthy birth, your parents' race, race, achieving trump of fame, and eke lift up thine eyes, my poor degree behold, my poor estate and misery, the time doth forth unfold. What better proof can be hereof than these our rags so torn, these paint and show our penury, which we to bide were born. These things full duly weighed in balance equals right, may alter and infringe thy mind and purposed delight. For they may blemish quite thy stock and worthy race, thy honour and thy ancestors at once they do deface. Therefore go choose a better choice, elect a metre mate, which may increase and ample make thy worthy the sanguine state. O oh, Gristle, thee I love. Now length or short my life. Let pity now appear to be within thy breast, full rife. It shall no wit abase my state, nor minish my renown, but cause thy fame thunder it forth throughout our royal town. What shall each white report of thee, if rigour thou now use? My untimely death thou haze, canst thou thyself excuse? A murderess thou shalt termed be, all men shall thee disdain, which cruelly without desert thy only lord was slain. And Iphis I, whose kindly heart doth beg and crave thy grace, if thou an exerites be, and turn from me thy face, poor Teusa's son is then forlorn, the Trojan is undone. If if this I do play my part, contempt thou canst not shun. Thy poverty can not prevail thy rigour to obscure, but rather cause and stir each white, disdain to put in your 
Thy ragged clouds, clothes thee argue not in poor estate to live. Thy virtues noble do thee make, such fate doth fortune give. That thou above all virgins art, by trump of fame extolled. Give rightful doom to Pyramus, like Thisbe love unfold. My daughter is a virgin pure, and wanteth to wrench store. For that respect doth faithful love in me increase the more. Much musing in my mind, in this sort I reply, Why should you seem me wretched white to love thus faithfully? I neither have fair Helen's shape, nor comely shining hue, Ne yet no kind of earthy coin, ne substance, this is true. And as for costly ornaments and sumptuous array, I want the best even now on me, behold, you may. There rests within this noble town full many worth a dame, worthy, many a worthy dame, which both for store and feature fair deserves the voice of fame. They may your high renown augment and elevate to skies. Take one of them, my low estate and parent stock despise. Let Grizel with her father live, bestow them, bestow on them your love. This answer take with equal state, learn how your suit to prove. Be Iphis true to such a one as plenty hath and store. Choose like to like, leave off for shame, express thy suit no more. O oh, careless youth that naught regardst my plaints and doleful tears. O oh, direful day, O oh, hapless hap. O oh, shortener of my years, O oh, pray appointed for my death, which lightly dost regard the life of him which thou with love shouldst gratefully reward. In sunder break thou heart, which thus with grief art tossed. Yield up thy breath from prison free, thy poor tormented ghost. Why shouldst thou longer live to couch on heaps thy pain? I loathe my life. If my good will doth reap myself disdain. If ever roosted rest within your rueful hearts, stream forth your plaints, ye muses, all with tears bewail my smarts. Take wellsprings to your eyes, let doleful tunes abound. Oh, pierce and fill the haughty clouds with your lamenting sound. Show forth my faithful heart, be records of my love. These plaints thrown forth my constancy apparently do prove. O oh, Janical, whose age ought honour it to be, if case that nature in the rest, I pray thee, pity me. If that these tears streamed forth from depth of heart proceed, and I shall grant to give the grace to recompense thy meed. Plight faith and troth to me, thou wilt not her deflower, ne spoil her garden fragrant of virgin's fruitful flower. To record heaven I call, and God that lives therein, plighting my faith in open priest to shun such guilty sin. I mind not as a harlot I with her to live my, lead my life, but by the force of wedlock's not to take her as my wife. Then to your honor, I my daughter dear do give, beseeching God that in his fear together you may live. Oh, happy be thy aged life and fortunate, I pray, which hath preserved thy loving Lord from danger and decay. Welcome to me, my mate elect, my joy and heart's delight the perfect length of vital life, which grief exterpest quite. Sith it hath pleased you, loving Lord, to fix your love on me, faith, love, and obedience due, I yield here unto thee. These gifts, more precious are than gold, and far excel all terran treasure. Oh, it delighteth me much thee to behold. In thy presence consisteth my solish, solace and pleasure. And Grizel turns to Jan uh, Janikel. 
Alas, poor silly girl, increased is thy smart. From father now in aged days, perforce thou, art, thou must depart. Who now in time of need shall thy estate relieve? To thee, to leave thee destitute of help, thy daughter sore doth grieve. Who now shall ro rule thy back and daily give thee food? I know not one that readily will do my father good. If that thou pine, I pine like case. I die if aught thou want, to wend from thee thus suddenly, my dollars are not scant. Who now shall comb thy hoary beard? Who now shall wash thy head? Who now to ease thy aged bones shall beat and make thy bed? Comfort thyself, my child. For me, God will provide. He is my rock, my staff, my stay, my trust and perfect guide. And sift that he by providence respected hath thy state and to the top of fortune's wheel and mercy elevate lament no more distill no tears though thou depart me though thou depart me fro for god that rules both heaven and earth hath willed it should be so swell not in pride still gentle be and lead a lowly mind to all estates full courteous be as nature hath assigned I will observe your hests to utmost of my might. Then God will bless thee with his grace and spite. My ladies, all I you require, my comely spouse, array, that we may haste to solemnize our happy wedding day. These ornaments received to deck her corpse with all. Right worthy lord, in every point fulfill your mind we shall. Come, lady mine, to father's house lead us the ready way. I yield ye matrons to your hest. Come on with me, I pray. And there we're going to stop the session. Makeover! Uh, I don't know about you. I, 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 we're, we're still mid-scene, uh, but the ladies uh, have uh, left with Grizel. Um, I don't know about you, but I feel a, a lump in my throat at the, you know, just what such a, a soppy romantic tale that we're being we're being sold here. I mean, it's I, I'm, I'm deeply moved uh, by all of the incidents that we've had. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yes. So that was a thing. Um, lots of questions i mean at no point does it this 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 whole setup you know we've had the marquis you know i should get married i should get married oh you'll do uh i heard some good things uh a trip advisor said uh, uh lot, lot the, the, the re reviews are very good uh what um oh, did, did, did he not know this already i mean he's got a plan hasn't he he knows who she is before he turns up oh yeah, yeah. but it's just like, but then coming on, I'll die for you, and you know, I'll, if I you you don't say you, but what? Yeah, but that's this is clearly just a convenience thing. Um, it's just so unutterably what? tedious. That's the problem I have with it. <laughs> just on and on and on and on and on and that, you know, she's so obedient, uh, and she's saying, "No, I can't possibly marry you because you're above me." <sighs> you know, it's it's. Where where is the interest? Can we not have comedy servants hitting each other? Give it a bit yeah, of life. I was going to say I, we are looking we are looking back in uh, fondly at the Those time were when, the days. when people came on. Yeah, um, physical violence uh, abounded, and I th uh, Helen put in the chat, and I think it's a really good point. If she gets, says goodbye to her father, you must go, and I'll never see you again. And just uh, as Helen said, you know. Why don't, why doesn't he come with them? Surely, if he's really rich, there's there's some 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 uh, you know, annex he could inhabit in the corner. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah, very very strange. Um, yeah, other thoughts. Um, uh, I'll go Rachel then Bryony. I don't know. I don't know. I feel like. There might be some twists and turns. I, I feel like just this weird, that weird Decker corpse thing, uh, that it might, it might be getting a little weird next time. 
So. Sadly, no. That's just uh, just a reference for oh. your physical body. Um, uh, it's it's that's 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 a modern uh, uh, issue with it with the text. Um, sadly, sadly, no. We're not going to get a strange corpse bride situation. You know, uh, it's uh, the the. Uh, we're 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 starting to wish for pirates in the chat. Um, <laughs> Because yeah, I mean, it's it's like we we had politic earlier doing all the stand up stuff and going. This is a scene surely where you'd have politic in the background, you know, riffing and doing wisecracking stuff. Uh, probably a, deeply unpleasant for modern ears, but at least there'd be a sort of engagement quality to that that we're not getting here. Uh, sorry, Brownie. Um, I I would just really like the um, rebuttal paragraph speech thing I, I'm going to take notes of that myself for future use um he did not that it worked in this case um as with most cases but she tried it was it was very eloquently put the uh, no thanks mate yeah oh yeah um and she's got a lot of no thanks mate um uh, stored up there um, yeah and he ignores it and he just snow plows over her with no if you reject me i want to die and, and i'm just going I, how is this my problem i think it's not aimed at convincing her i think it's aimed at convincing her father mm. sorry i snow plowed over eric there also uh, yeah i I'm it's fine i'm used to it no i'm kidding i was just going to say that it's interesting how it's sort of transactional but she has the opportunity to express a rebuttal uh it's kind of like fulgence and lucrece but she doesn't get her way uh she can't afford to get her way basically as far as i can tell hmm. yes they're, they're not exactly in the best of positions as a family you know we know they are desperately desperately poor um so uh we're into extra time um the the we 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 are over, over possibly over a third of the way through the play we've still got more of this scene to go um we have some dialogue between uh Jenical and uh and the marquis um and the various uh extended uh peoples uh so uh uh, it'll be interesting to see what they say in the absence of Grizel. Uh, I say interesting. I, 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 I don't know where that's going to go. Um, but yeah, we've got a play that's doing lots of things. Um, I'm, I'm not sure uh, where where to place it yet. Uh, I don't know if you want to reserve your opinions um, or if you have any final thoughts you want to throw in. You're allowed to uh, speak or, or forever hold your peace or, for that matter, uh, speak another day. Uh, so, uh, Rachel, do you have any final thoughts? Yeah, my final thoughts are just... I definitely have no idea where this is going. I mean, it, it seems like, from what they're saying, it's simple and straightforward. They're going to get married. But it, I feel like whatever this play is, has done so far, in some way, it, it doesn't fit, um, I don't know, the regular play structure in a way that, that you get. And I don't know if this is supposed to be a comedy or supposed to be a morality play or if it's setting me up to knock me down somewhere further along. Uh, it, it's kind of just offbeat and it, doing its own thing. Yes, we're still at a point in history where the idea of precisely how to define uh, what it means by comedy of um, uh, is is a little more fluid. Um, Liza, final thoughts. Uh. Well, uh, you you know my the eternal string on which I harp, or or one of them, God help you, is uh, that if something is good morality, does it make good theater? And it is hard to write good people in a characterful and interesting way. Um, so we're going to see Griselle under, under some duress as the play goes on. So I do want to see how this goes and what her writing is like. Also, I love politic persuasion. I know that they're a terrible person, but I want them to come to all my parties. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting when you're saying it's, it's hard to write good people. I, I, at the moment, I don't really have a problem with Griselle herself. It's 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 the Marquis who's not that engaging and who's not really a great person either. So it's it's, it's like uh, you want you want him to be more engaging 
in, in a problematic way. Um, yes, he, he doesn't really succeed at wooing us, mm. um, even if he does vaguely succeed at wooing Griselle, or at least her father. Yes, yeah, so I say I was I was definitely making notes about you know that that that's that's obviously the his wooing technique is superb so uh, must be no, God dear God no. Um, uh, Stephen, final thoughts. Uh, well, I'm not enjoying this. You may have picked up on that. Um, yeah, the Marquis was awful part. It's really uh, a, a sort of unrelenting desert of conventionality. Um, the only thing is, I wonder if I'm being slightly unfair to it, or rather, perhaps the format is unfair to it, because uh, as, um, I can't remember who said it. Sorry, I've got mind is off hunting haddock. Um, somebody's already said, we don't know what's going to happen. And if you're doing a production of it, you wouldn't be this as well, I'm clueless at this point. Um, you know, we would have some idea of where it was going and perhaps, you know, so perhaps my negative response is in, apart from the sort of dreadful gender ideology of, of what's going on here, but um, perhaps it is just that, you know, more so than with some other plays, you're kind of, uh, you're missing the signposting that a, a kind of contemporary production would, would give you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure that the storytelling is as unclear. I, I, I think the problem is we have some of those scenes with the Marquis don't really go anywhere. They're thematically important, but they're not pushing forward the idea he's going to marry her and that they're going to, you yeah. know, and that, that that element of the story is, is, is quite coming together. Uh, I don't know whether in production at pace that that is actually the issue um, or will be an issue, but... Um, I, th I think it's the the other underlying ideology of the of the text that is is going to be the the, the, the biggest stumbling block. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's. it's I, I understand what's happening, but I don't understand what that signifies. And a, you know, a kind of directorial vision would give you that sort of sense, perhaps. Hmm. Uh, Bryony, uh, being uh, uh, being uh, Grizel, uh, and uh, and uh, this your, this is your only session with the play this week, so I, I, I don't know whether you're, you're you're happy or sad on that front. Uh, final thoughts? Um, I'm really intrigued by it. I'm still on the fence about whether how 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 much I like it. There's elements that I definitely like, um, but I think Grizel is saved only by her eloquence in the way I, I, I'm, I'm fed up already of, of her telling you to, me to be obedient to my parents already. Shut up, shut up woman. Um, I'm not, I'm not down with that, but she, the way that she speaks is at least interesting. Um, if, even if the subject matter isn't always, um, but yeah, I hope, I hope that her obedience is tested soon. I want to, I want I, to stop, stop telling me how much you love them. Show me. Mm. Uh, Eric, final thoughts. Uh, I made two notes about like when trying to you know distill my final thoughts so that I don't forget them while other people were talking, and I wrote down Lily and arm wrestling, <laughs> and um, basically <laughs> I was thinking that um, that this point where they're you know the father accepts on behalf of um, Griselle, um this awkward compromise situation is basically where a Lily play would end. Um, <laughs> which is very, very weird to think. Uh, and also I was thinking that the sort of like arm wrestling is kind of that, that thing of push me, pull you kind of dynamic, which seems to be going on between Grisel and the Marquis until um, Mar no, the Marquis, until um, the father steps in, which is very, very sort of interesting because usually she wouldn't be allowed to negotiate um, at all, <laughs> I suppose, on her behalf. I don't know, this is an interesting sort of dynamic to think about. Well, uh, one of the uh, problems at this stage for making an assessment of the play is until we know how it ends, you know, it, it's very much this this question we've had before is, you know, will it stick the landing? Um, you know, it may make good of uh, things that we have earlier on. 
Uh, alternatively, it's that question of whether the text becomes something that we make something about rather than the uh, actually produce the text, if that makes sense, that we're producing something that is as much a reaction to what this play is doing uh, as it is to actually staging this play. There's, that we've got a number of texts that are uh, fundamentally too problematic for us to say, hey, let's 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 do a, a fun evening of misogyny. Um, uh, it's uh, it's you know, we're just not going to do it. Uh, but um, there might be something that we can we can uh, cull from this in terms of material. There's certainly a lot of very good uh, comedy business in politic um, and some of that stand up sort of clown material is definitely very colourable. We won't really know this until the end of the week, but uh, yes, hang in there, people. There may be some gems to steal. This is, as ever, an opportunity to steal material and ideas, even if it's not necessarily always uh, one where we go, we definitely, definitely are going for this play. Uh, if nothing else, you've got decent coverage of cats this evening. So uh, we our cat energy, we try to keep very strong. So um, it's another I'm, cat. I know. We got... That, that those are cats. For those on are on Zoom who are confused as to what is and is not a cat, that is a cat. Uh, just just uh, there. Um, unless anyone has any additional final thoughts, I will close the session. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, let's see if we have the patience to uh, continue with uh, patient Grizel. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs> cat waves goodbye. <laughs>